So on this one, we're looking for, uh, we know the delta voltage, presumably for the whole thing. Or is it just implying the voltage for these two marked points here? Yeah, actually on the bottom, instead of 2.4, it's actually 2.5. So um, in this problem, he was basically saying like how the current going through like to the circuit is 2.5. And so we just have to find like the resistor through, or sorry, the current through the unknown resistor, which is at the bottom. Okay. So is the 2.5 the incoming current? Yeah. So this current is 2.5 amps. Let's call that I1. And what do we know about these other branches here? Or was the current at the top 2.5 amps? Uh, so the incoming current is 2.5. Mm -hmm. But the only thing we know is like the voltage difference, like the voltage drop mm -hmm. is okay. 0.5. So if we know Which that voltage. Negative five. So if we know that, uh, so this has a voltage drop of negative five volts. Uh, if you know the voltage drop, and that's a resistor, so what's the usual voltage drop formula for a resistor? Uh, negative I, I. Yeah, delta V equals negative I times R. And in this case, we know we're given the voltage, we're given the resistance, so we should be able to solve for what? Uh, uh, current? Yeah. If we just divide both sides by negative R, we get I equals negative delta V over R. So if we just take opposite of that voltage drop, in other words, positive five volts, divided by the resistance, 10 ohms, that should tell us the current. And so what would that be here? A half. Yeah. So that'll be 0.5 amps, half an amp. So that tells us the current in that branch. We now know that this current, let's call that I2, is gonna be exactly half an amp. Um, I'm sorry, what is the 2.5? Um, this one? Yeah. I'm not sure, was there a reason uh, why that was no, not? No, I just wrote that there to like indicate that that's the incoming current. Okay, so we had a 2.5 current coming in. And yeah. apparently I wouldn't mark it on those branches because as soon as it hits the junction, it splits into the two different currents. I thought the current would stay the same. The total current is the same. So if we have, uh, for instance, we've got this, we know we have some amount of current going in the upper branch and then a different amount of current going in the lower branch. So we'd call that, let's say, I3. Uh, sorry, I was getting a little confused when I was going over this. So mm -hmm. we're in like, when the, I guess like when there's a junction. So mm -hmm. I, I learned that like how the current like stays the same or I was getting that confused with like voltage difference, like how voltage splits differently. I don't really know like the relationship between that. Uh, other way around, the current is gonna split as soon as it hits the junction. Okay. So you've got 2.5 amps coming in because the current is talking about how much charge flows past that point per second. And okay. so if you imagine 2.5 amps is describing how much charge, you could almost think of it as how many electrons per second, but it's not a, a physical count of the number of electrons. It's a description of how much charge those electrons carry. So how much charge flows past that point per second. So if you have, and amps is just coulombs of charge per second. If you've got two and a half coulombs coming into this point per second, you also have to have 2.5 coulombs leaving every second. But there's two paths for it to leave by. So it's not like you get 2.5 amps on one path and 2.5 amps also on the other path. We know we have 0.5 coulombs per second leaving on one path. How much is left to leave on the other path? Yeah, 
because we know that the, the incoming current is 2.5 coulombs every second. The total outgoing current has to be 2.5 coulombs every second. Oh, because they have to add up to 2.5? Exactly. And this goes back to the, the junction rule that the sum of the currents flowing into a point must equal the sum of the currents flowing out of that point. In this context, the current in would be I1, current out would be I2 and I3 combined together. So that's how we would apply the junction rule here. We've got 0.5 amps plus something equals the incoming current of 2.5 amps. So that something has to be two amps. Okay. And we now know the current in each branch. Generally, each path has its own current. And the current's only going to change if you hit a junction and it splits, or if you've got several paths joining back together at a junction. But along any one path with no junctions, the current should just be one single value the whole way. OK. I think you might have been thinking of voltage in the sense yeah. that uh, if you're looking at voltage, like let's say if we just highlight all the regions that are the same voltage, then for instance, this entire region would be one single value of voltage. Because any points connected by just wire, regardless of whether there's junctions or not, those points are all at the same voltage. Okay. Which is kind of equivalent to points in a fluid being at the same pressure. But as soon as you cross over the resistor, you're now at a different voltage. And then you cross over the other resistor, you're at a uh, another different voltage. So this diagram, there's presumably going to be three different values of voltage. The voltage on the left side, voltage on the right side of the 10 ohm resistor, and voltage on the right side of the other resistor. But at the end, the voltages have to add up, right? Um, they might or might not. It really depends on what happens here. If these paths join back together, like if we had a uh, if we had more of the diagram, if we knew that these paths merged back together like this, in that case, these two points would be connected so they'd have to be the same voltage. That is, uh, this point and this point are the same, are connected by wire. So they've got to have the same voltage. So in a case like this, if we had more detail and we knew where things were connected and the wires looked like this afterwards, then we would say there's a voltage on the left side of both of these resistors and another different voltage on the right side of both of these resistors. But there's only those two voltages involved at all. So the voltages would have to be the same if they were connected. Uh, well, the, the voltage is the voltage right after the 10 ohm resistor and the voltage right after the mystery resistor would be, yes. So then would that mean that they have the same voltage drop? Uh, yes. If two, if, resist, if two paths are in parallel, they have to have the same voltage drop because they're both starting at the same high voltage on one side and they're just different paths leading to the same low voltage on the other side. But any okay. two or more paths that start at the same high voltage and end at the same low, vol low voltage have the same voltage drop. In fact, that's effectively how we define parallel. Parallel paths means that they start at the same voltage and end at the same voltage. They're just different paths of getting there. But in series, they wouldn't be. Right. In series, they're all on the same path. In parallel, there are several different paths for getting from the same starting point to the same ending point. Okay. So in series, they all have to have the same current, but they split up the available voltage. In parallel, they all have to have the same voltage drop, but they split up the available current. Okay. In this case, though, I think we can actually uh, determine more information. Let me keep that. We can determine more information based on the fact that we know the current here. Um, and we want to find, I guess that is all the information we can find because we don't know the resistance and we don't know the voltage drop. If we did know they connected, like let's say we did know that. If we did actually know they were connected, so these would have to have the same voltage. We could say this mystery resistor also experiences a five volts voltage drop. So we would, we would then have, 
this voltage or this delta voltage is also five volts if we knew they were connected there. If we don't know they're connected, there's nothing we can really do here. But if we do know those are connected, then this voltage drop is also negative five volts. And now we know voltage and current. So what could we solve for? Uh, the um, mm -hmm. resistor. resistor. Yeah. If we go back to, once again, Ohm's law, delta V equals negative I times R for a resistor. How would you solve that for resistance? Um, you just uh, do five, yeah, yeah five volts. Yet. What was just that? In terms of, uh, no numbers yet, just in terms of the variables. And then oh, okay. The um, then it would be delta V resistor divided by negative I. Yeah. And we could put the negative out front for simplicity. Uh, so then we can just, now, and at that point, we can now plug in numbers. And I would generally recommend, oh, actually, I guess we need to divide by current there because we're trying to solve for R. And generally, I would recommend solving in terms of variables first whenever possible, because then instead of just getting a number for that problem, you get a formula that can be used anytime you have a situation like that. It also often makes it easier to find out if something cancels out, if some, if some particular value doesn't actually matter. But if we now fill in those values, current was two amps. So negative five divided by two, would, or positive five, because the negatives cancel out. So we get 2.5 ohms. So if this is indeed the case, if these really do merge together again, making these have the same voltage drop, then this resistor would have a resistance of 2.5 ohms. But we would only be able to determine that if we knew they really were in parallel, if we knew that they really did merge back together again. Any other questions on that circuit? All right, then let's try out the next one as well. I have a question, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I was wondering if you had three like resistors in parallel, would the voltage mm -hmm. drop also be the same? Yeah. Or does it only work with two? Oh, yeah, it could be any number. I mean, we often only work with pairs just because it makes the, uh, if you look at a single pair at a time, it makes the results easier to deal with. But no matter okay. how many resistors you've got, if you have, uh, if you're dealing with like a wire that splits three ways, and then joins back together. And you've got resistors like so. One way you could do that is by just, uh, if you want to combine these resistors, you could say one over R total equals one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3. The formula extends to any number of resistors. You just add together the inverses of all of them and then take the inverse of the result. Because if you look at the voltages, uh, presumably you're going to have some starting high voltage on one side. Like, let's say we take a look at this location having some voltage. Any location connected by just wire is going to have the same voltage all the way up to the resistor itself. Mm -hmm. So all these locations have the same, let's say, high voltage. And then on the other side, if you take a look at like this point, because by going through the resistor, you lose some voltage or gain some voltage, depending on the direction. So this is going to be at a different voltage, but every point connected to that by just wire is going to be at the same voltage. Uh, okay. So in this entire region that I've just drawn out, there's only two voltages, the voltage on one side of this trio of resistors and the voltage on the other side. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you can have any number of resistors in parallel. You can just add the inverses and then invert the result. You could also have any number of resistors connected in series. In that case, you would just add the resistances directly. Mm 
Uh, then let's try this uh, this resistor here, or this sample circuit here. We've got a five five volt battery. We are told what the current is. We know the resistance is. In this one, I think we actually may have more information than we strictly need. Because if we didn't know the current through the battery, knowing the battery and all the resistors values is actually enough. But let's see if we can use this information to figure out what's going on here. Uh, how many different currents would you expect here? And why is that? Um, there would be one like right before it hits um, the where there's like the resistors are one. The and junction then there. Be, pardon? The junction there? Yeah. And then the second one would be um, before, uh, like between the one and the two. Oh, so three, because there'd be one after two as well. Uh, for currents, though, what do we know about all of these currents? If this is just one path. What should we expect about all those currents that I just marked in orange? It's going to be the same. Yeah. So those are all going to be the same single value of current. Let's just call that. Uh, well, we already it's already told us that it's, that's two amps. So let's call that I one equals two amps. But what happens to current when it hits a junction? It splits. Yeah, so we're going to have a split in current flowing this way and separately current flowing this way. So usually we'd say that splits into two different currents. We'd have, maybe we could call this I2 and I1, or I3, I mean. But in this particular case, what can we assume about I2 and I3? What do we know about how this splits here? I2 plus I3 will equal I1. Yeah, we definitely know I2 plus I3 equals I1 from the junction rule, which in this case is two amps. And in this case, should we expect it to split evenly or should one of them get more current than the other? Evenly because they have the same uh, resistance. Right, this is the one case where we know it does split evenly. If the two paths have identical amounts of resistance, then the two paths have to get the same amount of current. So this is going to split half and a half, one amp and one amp. Usually you wouldn't assume that. If they have different currents that are different resistances, then you know whichever one has more resistance gets less current, and whichever one has less resistance gets more current. And it should split up proportionally. So you can predict it using proportions. But we know for sure that if they're the same resistance, then they get the same current share. Any questions on that? Does that mean that the current going out of the junction um, before it hits that resistor that's two ohms would still be two amps? If we're talking about this junction? Yeah, like right outside after it's done with the parallel and right before the resistor. Um, yeah, because we've got two amps, we got one amp and one amp coming in. Those add up to two, so we've got to have two amps coming out. Okay, cool thing. Which is why this the entire loop, except for the parallel branch, the entire loop is just one current, two amps. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what would we do if like one of the one ohm resistors was not one ohm? So like if they were not equal? If they were different, we could still say their currents have to add up to two amps or whatever it happens to be okay. because of the junction rule. Uh, but to figure out how it splits up, you would want to use uh, voltages. In fact, let's let's try that out. Let's say we have, uh, let me modify this problem. I think when my professor did it yesterday, he found like our, e, our EQ, so like mm -hmm. the total resistance and then use the loop rule. But when he did that, I didn't quite understand like how he figured all that out. Okay, well, let me modify this to make it uh, a little more interesting. Let's say we have, uh, let me clear yeah. some of the data here. So ignoring these values for now, and let's say we don't already know the current, 
And let's say these resistors are, um, <clears throat> let me use some good values here. Let's say three ohms. And let me label these. Let's call these R2. R3. Let's say that is uh, four ohms. And Uh, yeah, let's just try it like that, see what we get. And then let's go say this is R1 equals two ohms. So we still have this situation where we have uh, three currents to worry, to worry about. <clears throat> we have a current flowing through the main branch, the main path. So we'll call that I1. <clears throat> and we also have an unknown current flowing through branch two and an unknown current flowing through branch three. And we, ideally, we'd like to know what those currents are. Uh, we at least know how they split up. We know that I1 plus I2, or sorry, I2 plus I3 has to add up to I1. Because at each of these junctions, for example, if you consider this junction here, the current flowing in would be I1. The current flowing out would be I2 plus I3. So we at least know that I1 equals I2 plus I3. And the junction rule. Any questions on this so far? So the junction rule applies to like all circuits, right? Just uh, yeah. In fact, it's not even just at junctions, at any location the current in must equal the, must equal the current out. Okay. For instance, if you just look at this spot on the wire, the current in must equal the current out, which basically just means in this case, I1 equals I1. But this is really why we know that a single path has only one value of current. If you take a look at any region, like let's say this resistor, the current into this resistor is I1, the current out of this resistor is I1. They can't be different. You can even apply it to not just a point, but any region. If you just draw out some region, like let's say we just draw some squiggly blob on the map. If you count up all the currents flowing into this region and all the currents flowing out of this region, they have to balance out. The total of all the currents flowing into this border has to equal the total of all the currents flowing out of this border, no matter what shape the border is. So that's an extension of the junction rule. Any questions on that so far? So to figure out what these currents are, uh, what we're gonna need to do is figure out, well, one way to do it anyway, is to figure out the total resistance. If we can simplify this so it act to figure out how it acts like just one battery and one resistor, if we can make this simplified circuit, then that simplified circuit is much easier to analyze. Uh, the battery, of course, is still five volts because there's just one battery. If there's several batteries you can, and they're in series, you can just add them together and just treat them as one big battery. But how do we figure out the total equivalent resistance here? Um, you can first do um, all one over 
r2 plus 1 over r3 then flip it and then um that yeah the one you're circling in pink will be mm -hmm. in series with the one um that's two ohms and then yeah. you um add them yeah because we know that the r2 and r3 are definitely in parallel i would start with them because they're a pair that are easy to identify R2 and R3 are very definitely in parallel because they're just two paths that start at the same point, branch off, and then merge together at the same point. So that means we should be able to calculate one over the total resistance, which I'm going to call R23, equals one over R2 plus one over R3. And we can fill those in. Uh, one over R2 would be one over three, and then one over four. And then how would we add those together? What would be a useful denominator to use here if we've got threes and fours? Well, yeah, we can write that as twelfths. One third is the same as three twelfths, or sorry, four twelfths, because we can multiply the numerator and denominator by four. One fourth, we multiply numerator and denominator by three, and we get three twelfths. So one over R two three would be four plus three seven twelfths. And then what else do we need to do to isolate R two three? Flip it. Yeah, we just invert both sides. We get twelve sevenths ohms. So the the these two resistors together act like one resistor whose resistance is twelve sevenths. And then that resistor, if we just treat this parallel branch as just one big resistor, whose resistance is 12 sevenths ohms, that is now in series with R1. So what can we do with those resistors? Just add them. Yeah, we can just add those up, 12 sevenths plus another two. And if we want to put these in the same denominator, that's the same as uh, 14 sevenths. So if we just add 12 sevenths ohms from R2 and 3 together, plus an extra 14 sevenths ohms, we get 26 over 7. So all the resistors together act like just one big 26 sevenths ohm resistor. Any questions on that so far? And the advantage of writing this simplified circuit is that since it's just acting like a single loop, there's just one current we need to find. And how would we calculate that missing current? Um, we have the voltage of the battery. Mm -hmm. um, Can you use yeah. the loop rule? What was that? Can you use the loop rule here? Yeah, if we write out the loop rule, because we now have just one loop, so that makes it much simpler. All these delta voltages, delta voltages plus delta or delta V battery plus delta V resistor, that's a complete loop, so those have to add up to zero. And if we fill in the values, battery is just going to be epsilon, resistor is going to be minus IR. And we're trying to solve for current. So how would you isolate current here? If you solve that formula for current, what would you get? E Just in terms of the variables. Um, e over R. Yeah. The voltage of the battery divided by the resistance, specifically the total resistance. So that's going to be uh, 5 volts. Dividing by 26 sevenths is the same as multiplying by 7 26 So that'll be 35 over 26. Uh, amps. So that's the current. We now have the current in this simplified loop. And we can now tie this back into the original circuit based on the fact that this current, the 35 over 26 amps, should be equivalent to which current in the original circuit? I1. Yeah. 
I1, since that's the current through the battery, and the battery is the one thing we didn't simplify. So we now know the current in the battery is 3526 amps, or 1 and 9 26. Uh, that current is certainly going to split up when it hits this junction, but we at least know it's 3526 amps through the battery and also through R1. R1 is in series with the battery, so they have to have the same current. So we at least know the current in resistor one. We don't know how it splits up across resistors two and three, but we at least know I2 plus I3 has to add up to 3526. Any questions on that so far? All right, so to figure out how it splits up, uh, one way to do this is to start looking at voltages. If we just start labeling voltages everywhere, um, then we can figure out what the voltage drop across R2 and R3 is, and then use that to find the current. And since there's only a few voltages that are gonna be involved, it's gonna be fairly straightforward to label them. I would usually start with the point right before the battery. And let's just call that point zero volts. Also, with this point is zero volts, just as a label. Uh, where else has to be zero volts? Where else is going to be the same voltage? Right after the, the two ohm resistor? Yeah, because all those locations, everything along this path, those are, that's just all connected by just wire. Any points connected by wire are all gonna be at the same voltage. So all of those points are at the same voltage. In fact, I usually visualize this as being like a, have you seen like the, the, the paint fill tool on a graphics program looks, usually looks like a paint bucket tipping over. You click on a spot with a color and it fills that color out until it hits borders. Yeah. Voltage is a lot like that. If you have, like, if this is a zero volt region, it's like we're painting this whole region with a zero volt paint can. You just keep pouring in the property of being at zero volts and it spreads out along wire until it hits a battery or a resistor or something. Because wire alone doesn't change the voltage. However, if we cross over the battery, we get a different voltage. So let's say we cross over the battery, we get to this location here. What would be the voltage there? volts? Yeah, the battery provides a boost in voltage. Specifically, it adds five volts. So we started at zero, we go through the battery that adds five, we're now at five volts. And not just this location, but filling out until we hit anything else. So if we continue the five, the, the property of being at five volts out along this path, all these locations are at five volts, all these locations Continuing along the wire, even through the junction, all these locations are at five volts. This is a five volt region. So this entire region I've just marked in pale red, those are all at five volts. <clears throat> so we can mark five volts anywhere along this path we want. All these locations are at a voltage of five. But then we cross over these resistors and what happens to the voltage? Does a resistor have a delta voltage associated with it? Yes. And what is that voltage difference? Negative IR. Right, so when we go through this resistor, we're gonna lose some voltage equal to negative IR we don't know what I is, so we can't actually calculate this yet, but we at least know we're gonna lose some voltage and we get to this new voltage that's some lower value. But since we can fill out until we hit something else, we know all these points in this region have to be at the same voltage value as each other. So this entire segment between the resistors that's just one single value of voltage. We don't know what it is yet, but we have some unknown V 
but it's a, a constant V in this entire region. So we can split up the entire circuit into just three values for voltage. We've got a zero volt region before the battery, a five volt region after the battery, but before we hit these resistors and some unknown voltage between zero and five between the resistors. Any questions on how that splits up so far? We can also figure out what that unknown voltage is because there's one thing we do know. There's one resistor we know everything about. Uh, which one specifically? The two ohm. Yeah, if we focus on that one resistor, uh, this resistor here, the two ohm resistor, we know everything there is to know about it. We know the resistance and we know the current. So for this resistor, since we know everything there is to know about it, we can calculate the rest of it. We know uh, I and R, so we can find delta V. Specifically, we go back to delta V equals negative IR. Uh, why do, uh, what do we know about I for this? Uh, we know the current in the entire, there's only three currents here, right? There's I1 okay. through the main branch, or the main loop, and then it splits into I2 through the upper branch and I3 through the lower branch. Mm -hmm. But resistor one, this two ohm resistor is part of the main loop, the main path. So that's got yeah. the I1, 3526 amps. Oh, it still has the same current. Yeah, because oh, okay. any anytime you just got one path and it hasn't split, all those points on that path, every point on this path has to have that same I1 flowing through it. The only points on this entire path that are not 3526 amps are these two branches in parallel, R2 and R3. Those would have different currents. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's actually calculate that delta voltage. Uh, if we take the current 3526 amps, and multiplied by the resistance, two ohms, we get, uh, I guess the two and the 26 reduced, so we get 35 over 13 volts. So that's the voltage drop for resistor two. When we go from the green unknown voltage to the blue zero volts from here to here, we know we're losing 35 and 35 thirteenths volts. So if you start at some unknown voltage and you lose 35, 13 volts and end up at zero, what's the unknown voltage you started at? It's the total I plus um, the one we just figured out. Uh, we're not starting at five and, and losing something. We're starting at, if you backtrack, if you compare, uh, this point and this point. If you compare those points, we know we have uh, something plus the delta voltage, negative 35 thirteenths, and we end up at zero. Oh, so it would be positive 35 over 13. Yeah, so that's the unknown voltage here if we're backtracking from, because we end at zero, we know we lost 35 thirteenths, so we had to have started at positive 35 thirteenths. So we now know the value of that. Which part is negative 35 over 13, the resistor? What was that? Which part is negative 35 over 13 volts? Uh, that's the delta voltage for the resistor. Oh, I see, okay. So I should mark that as delta V for resistor one the two ohm resistor. <clears throat> uh, so since we know the, uh, and, and in general for any resistor, if you know the current and the resistance, you can immediately just multiply those together to find the voltage drop. And then you can reverse engineer that. If you know you lose 35 thirteenths volts and end at zero, you had to start off at zero plus 35 thirteenths volts. In fact, if you go backwards, you could even think of the resistor as adding voltage. If you start, on the end of the resistor and go back to the beginning of the resistor from left to right here, 
you start at a zero volt region, you add 35 13 volts because you're going backwards and you end up at 35 13 volts. Which means if we now take a look at R2, we know the, the voltage right before and right after. Right before we're at a five volt region, right after we're at a 35 13 volts region. And let's go ahead and put everything into the same denominators. Uh, five would be, five times 13 would be a, no, 65. So let's write this as 65 over 13 volts. That's just five volts written in terms of 13ths. So what we're now looking at is a resistor two is taking us from a 65 13 volt region to a 35 13 volt region. So what's the delta voltage there? 30 over 13. Yeah. Delta V is if we just subtract 35 over 13 minus 65 over 13, final minus initial. And we would treat that as negative because it's a voltage drop. In fact, if you subtract final minus initial, 35 minus 65 would be negative 30 over 13. And we can set that equal to negative IR. Because ultimately we're trying to find the current. So how would you isolate current in that equation? How would you find I here? If delta V equals negative IR, then I equals? Uh, negative delta V over R. Yeah. And we have the values of delta V and R. We know delta V is negative 30 over 13 because that's the difference between the voltage right before and the voltage right after. The negatives cancel out, so we get 30 over 13. Dividing by the resistance, which is three, the 30 and the three become just 10. So 10 thirteenths and volts over ohms becomes amps. So we now know the current through the resistor two. That's gonna be 10 thirteenths amps. Any questions on that so far? And then for resistor three, we can use the same sort of approach we can still say current is negative delta V over R. And how much voltage is resistor three as resistor three getting? If these are in parallel, what does that tell us about their voltage drops? They're the same. Yeah, they gotta be the same. Because note that resistor th resistors two and three both start at 65 13 volts and they both end at 35 13 volts. So it's the same change in voltage because they're both starting at the same high voltage and they're both ending at the same low voltage. So this is still gonna be 30 over 13, but we're dividing by a different resistance. Specifically, we're dividing by four ohms. 30 over four reduces to 15 over two. And then the two and the 13 in the denominator combined, so we just get 15 over 26. So that would be current three, 15 over 26 amps. Any questions on those currents? Um, where did you get the 65 over 13 um, volts from? Uh, that's the five volts, but converted into 13ths because it's useful to have everything in the same denominator so we can compare them more easily. Oh, I see, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just write as five over one, then multiply the numerator and denominator by 13. Also as one final check here, what should I2 and I3 add up to? I1? Yeah, going back to the junction rule we were looking at at the very beginning, I2 and I3 should add up to I1. If we actually check that, We'll want to put these in the same denominator. 10 over 13 is the same as how many over 26? 20. Yeah, so if we write this as 20 over 26, the currents are now 20 over 26 plus 15 over 26, and those do indeed add up to 35 over 26.
so this, these numbers that we get in the end do all fit together with the loop rule or the junction rule that we would expect. Any questions on that so far? And also if you compare these 20 over 26 versus 15 over 26, ignoring the 26 for now, if you just look at the numerators 20 and 15, what's the ratio of 20 and 15? Or what's the proportion there? The ratio 20 to 15 reduces to what? Four over three. Yeah. The ratio of currents is a four over three ratio. How does that compare with the resistances? Like the inverse? Yeah. The resistors have a three to four proportion. The, the currents have a four to three proportion. It's the same ratio just flipped because the one with more resistance gets less current and the one with less resistance gets more current. So that's another thing you can always check. If you're at least as, as long as you're just dealing with a pair of resistors in parallel, the ratios should be should be exactly inverted. The ratio of resistors and the ratio of currents should be exact inverses of each other. So that's another uh, one last thing you can check to make sure it all fits together. Any other questions on that? All right, uh, then I think that's it for now. Uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions for next time and we can continue from there. Thank you.